Monsieur le directeur adjoint de Paris School of Economics, chers amis, chers invités, euh, on a le grand plaisir de vous recevoir aujourd'hui euh, en présence de conférenciers de haute notoriété. Et je tiens à saisir l'occasion euh, pour féliciter Monsieur le directeur adjoint de ce partenariat qu'on a avec PSE. Vous réussissez toujours à nous ramener les meilleurs conférenciers et nous vous sommes très reconnaissants euh, d'animer nos murs par euh, des thématiques toujours de plus en plus intéressantes. On va parler d'adaptation ce jour. On en a besoin dans ce monde complexe. Euh, L'intitulé me plaît particulièrement, l'art des bonnes erreurs. Il y en a des bonnes, parce que parfois, on apprend en faisant erreur et on aura euh, à apprendre certainement beaucoup de nos conférenciers qui vont nous parler de cette thématique. Encore merci euh, euh, d'avoir perpétué cette belle tradition de conférence. Euh, nous sommes toujours heureux de vous recevoir ainsi que vos invités. Euh, je suis désolé ce soir, il n'y a pas trop de monde. Il doit être chaud, sous le choc de l'information euh, ou probablement des effets météo. Mais on espère pour les prochaines avoir toujours euh, un grand public. Merci. Merci, Monsieur le Directeur, pour votre gentillesse, et votre accueil toujours aussi bienveillant et chaleureux. C'est un plaisir d'être à la Maison de la Tunisie pour ce, cette conférence qui s'inscrit donc dans un cadre plus vaste, vous l'avez compris, de, de conférences dites grand public, public éclairé, on va dire, pour qui est une démission de, de Paris School of Economics pour diffuser la, la culture économique. Et c'est toujours un, avec beaucoup de plaisir qu'on vient dans vos murs et on est toujours certain de recevoir un, un accueil euh, chaleureux. Donc euh, merci, et oui, ce partenariat va, va continuer et va fleurir euh, dans, dans les mois qui viennent. Uh, maybe I'll switch to English to <laughs> uh, welcome uh, Tim Harford uh, today, who is going to, to give this, uh, this conference. Uh, so Tim, also known as the undercover economist, right, uh, is, a, is a writer, uh, has a column in the Financial Times, he's invited a, a researcher at Nuffield College in uh, Oxford, and probably many other things that I don't know of. Uh, he's the author of uh, six books, and I've been told that there is the seventh uh, on, uh, on the way. Uh, so the five first books have been translated in, uh, in French uh, by the book uh, University Press, and uh, the sixth one, I, don't, I think, is also uh, will be out in June uh, next year. Uh, so Tim has sold uh, over a million uh, copy of the Undercover Economist, I, if I'm correct. And uh, I think it's a, I mean, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome you here. And uh, as I was saying to uh, Mr. Frika, for it's part of the mission of PSC to try to uh, bring uh, economics culture to a larger public than just the specialist. And I think in this field, you are definitely one of the best uh, person to, to have uh, around. Uh, last conference was Angus Deaton, which was a bit more technical, maybe, but uh, was also. Uh, a very good conference, but I think it's really in the in, the, uh, in this uh, following uh, conference, uh, it's it's going to be going to be great for all of us to learn about how to make mistakes. I think we all do <laughs> mistakes, uh, so how to do good mistakes that might be more difficult to choose the right mistakes to make. <laughs> but I'll leave you the floor uh, right away and thank you very much for uh, your welcome. So I think the, for your uh, conference, so the, I think the, the format that we more or less agreed upon is that Tim is going to talk for a bit less than an hour and then there will be questions and answers uh, introduced by uh, Antoine Bozio uh, after, after the talk for about a half an hour or so. Okay. So welcome and thank you very much for stopping by in, in Paris. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure to, to be here in Paris. Um, thank you very much to the PSC for the invitation. Thank, thank you to my publishers at, at De Book for, for translating my books into French and bringing them to a, to a French audience. Does this, is this working? Can you hear me at the back? Excellent. Um, the last time I was in Paris, uh, I woke up and discovered the UK had voted to leave the European Union. Um, it's also an interesting day today. Um, maybe I shouldn't come to France anymore. It's, please don't blame me. Um, but it seems like a very uh, good day to examine 
the role of making mistakes, and why mistakes can be positive as well as negative, and how to try to make more positive, more productive mistakes than we often do. And I thought I would start by telling you a story that's nothing to do with economics at all, but we'll come to the economics. The story is about this woman. You may recognize her photograph, but there's no reason why you should. Her name is Twyla Tharp. And Twyla Tharp is one of America's great choreographers. Uh, she has she won numerous prizes over the years with her very intelligent, challenging, modern style of choreography. She has worked with Philip Glass, the minimalist composer. She's worked with a great dancer, Mikhail Baryshnikov. She's worked with Milos Forman, the director of the film Amadeus. She's worked with everybody. She's a, a fascinating and very creative person. But I want to tell you about one particular show that she decided to produce. She wanted to make a musical, sort of musical, sort of concert, based on the music of Billy Joel. You know, Billy Joel, who wrote Piano Man and Uptown Girl, very middle-of-the-road American rock musician. And Twyla Tharp was somehow going to take her, her very uh, challenging, sharp dance, and she was going to marry it to Billy Joel's music. So she called Billy Joel. She suggested the idea to him. He said, great. He later said, if you stand in Twyla Tharp's way, you die. So <clears throat> he handed over control of, of the songs, and she began the project. She raised money to produce the show. She did the choreography. She hired the musicians. She wrote the, the script, the first draft of the script. Really, all of this was her. She was doing the creative work. She was doing the entrepreneurial work, her idea. And then in the summer of 2003, the show premiered on the stage of the Schubert Theatre in Chicago. Ultimately, it was going to Broadway. But first, you start in Chicago. You just try things out. The show opened. The next day, the newspaper reviews came out. It was a disaster. It was a terrible, terrible, terrible musical. One of the reviewers said it was embarrassing. Another said it was naive. Another said it, it was confusing. Half the audience were turning to the other half of the audience and saying, what just happened? Who, who just died? And to, to add to the humiliation, the American media decided to change the rules. So normally, when you do this tryout in Chicago, it's only the Chicago regional press will report on this. They review it like a local show. And then when it comes to Broadway, then the national press review it. But this time, they decided to change the rules because the thing is, Billy Joel is so famous. And the show was so bad. <laughs> they just had to say something. So one of the New York newspapers, Newsday, decided to take the Chicago Review and reprint it. So now everybody in New York, everybody in the country, knows that this massive turkey has been created in Chicago and it's going to flap its way down to Broadway. And to make it even worse, all this is Twyla Tharp's fault. She had total creative and business control. A disaster. So let's come back to Twyla Tharp a bit later. But the argument that I want to make is that actually we should take the same kind of catastrophic, career-limiting, publicly humiliating decisions that Twyla Tharp took. We, we need to do that. It's good for us, but it's good for the society around us, for people to take risks and to make mistakes. Now, I realize this m may not feel like a very sensible thing to say. So let me first say a little bit about why I think that that's so important. When you look at the history of economic growth, the 20th century, many huge political mistakes in the 20th century, but as a story of economic growth, it was a dramatic success. The standard of living of ordinary people between 1900 and the year 2000, it improved unrecognizably 
in France, in, in the Eurozone in general, in the UK, in the USA, in, in all uh, developed countries. It was a transformative century. But then when you look at the details, you see corporate failure after corporate failure. This process of economic growth is basically a process of idiots trying things and failing. That's what happens. You can see it very clearly if you look at the statistics of the life and death of companies. About half of them fail quite quickly. Somebody sets up a shop, but it sells clothes that nobody wants to buy, food that nobody wants to eat, coffee nobody wants to drink. And so the shop closes down and then someone else tries something new, something different, something better. Sometimes uh, a new idea comes along and there is no reason why it should work. I don't know, a Starbucks. Why would, Star why would anybody drink Starbucks? But the idea spreads. And the market says, that actually, this is what we wanted all along. Who would have predicted it? But this is what we wanted all along. And there's that process of trial and error. And again, if you look at the corporate history of, say, the, the world's biggest companies 100 years ago, you won't recognize many of the names. Or you may recognize the names from museums, like Singer, who made sewing machines. My, my mother had a Singer sewing machine. You could push it with a pedal. They were one of the, I think, the, the seventh largest business in the world, Singer, who made sewing machines. And now we have new names, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple. No one would recognize these, these names 40 years ago. Well, maybe Apple, but they think that's something to do with the Beatles. So you have old companies, they die out, new companies start up. This amazing process of rising living standards, when you look in the detail, it's all experimentation and failure. New ideas, some spread, many fail. And you might say, well, yeah, but wouldn't it be better to not fail? Wouldn't it be better if we only had the good ideas? Well, sure it would be, but I, I haven't yet managed to find anybody who can explain to me how that would work, how people would not make mistakes in this process. But let me give you a sense of why that might be. Um, so there is a, uh, an economist called, well, he's really a physicist, called Cesar Hidalgo, who draws pictures of the world economy. This is a picture drawn by Cesar. He's a physicist at MIT, and you can tell this is the kind of picture a physicist at MIT draws. So we economists, we just have lines, right? But wow, physics is amazing. What, what is this? It's not a geographical uh, map. This is a map of how different products are similar or different to other products. So the clusters on this map are clusters of similar kinds of products. And of course, you can't see the details of this. You don't need to see the details of this. I just want to give you a sense of, of the, the complexity of this map that Cesar Hidalgo is drawing. And then I want you to think about the fact that this map is an absurd simplification. This is so much cruder, so much lower resolution than the real economy. So when Cesar drew this map, he used 5,000 different uh, products in his, uh, in his database that allowed him to draw the map. But 5,000 products is nothing. Sure, if you look down a, a, a trade statistics database, you can see statistics for 5,000 different product categories. But if you just walk into Carrefour or Walmart or Tesco and you count the products, not even the number of products, but the number of types of product, there are probably 100,000. You can, you can count 5,000 products one a second in one and a half hours. But 100,000 products, that will take you 24 hours. And if you really want to count the number of products on sale in New York, London, Paris, Tokyo, a major modern urban economy, we don't really know, but we think about 10 billion distinct products and services. If you want to count them, one a second, that will take you 417 years. Okay, we can wait but maybe, maybe not. So that just goes to show you, remember that map I showed you, the confusing map? That's drawn with only 5,000 products. But a, a real economy has 10 billion products. We cannot see all this stuff going on. We can't 
perceive it all. We can't predict what will happen, as we found out yet again last night. We can't predict what will happen. And our brains are just not built to deal with these numbers. So just to give you some context, if you go to a hunter-gatherer society, we, we think are basically the ancestors of our societies. You count the products, maybe 300 different products. You could count them in five minutes. They have the same brains as us. Fundamentally, they're the same as us. But those, that's the complexity that our brains were evolved to deal with, social complexity, not this economic complexity. So of course, we make mistakes. And we should make mistakes. And economic success in general is built on this process of experimenting, of trial and error. So when you put it like that, it, that seems kind of, that seems okay. You, you can talk about experimentation in the marketplace. It doesn't feel too dangerous. But the challenge is, of course, things are very different when I say, okay, but you know, now I need to go and make mistakes. You, you need to go and make mistakes. That's not so easy. I remember listening to a great talk by one of the senior creative people at Disney. He had worked with Walt Disney himself. He was one of the great old men of Disney. And we were speaking together at a conference, and he spoke first. And he, he, would, he said, we knew we had to fail at half of everything we did. If we didn't fail at half of what we did, we knew we weren't being creative enough. We weren't being original enough. We weren't taking enough risks. And then everybody, everybody sitting listening to him, they were, everyone was like, yeah, mm, OK, yeah, sounds good. Sounds great when the Disney guy says it. Then I came on the stage and I said, yeah, I agree. He's completely right. But by the way, could I just check, you were all nodding, who is going to go back to the office on Monday and start failing at half of what they do? Any volunteers? It sounds really nice in the abstract, but when you actually get to the specifics, who, no, who plans to fail? Nobody plans to fail. Because it hurts. And we find it difficult. So I said this would be a talk about the art of good mistakes. So I want to talk a bit about what are the barriers? Why do we find it difficult to make mistakes? Why do we find it difficult to make good mistakes, to make productive mistakes, to learn from the mistakes that we've made? And I'm, I'm going to talk about four different obstacles. The first is, I think, really a social obstacle. It's to do with the way that we work together. So I'm going to show you a very short film that will save us a lot of social science, OK? <clears throat> and I'm going to try. Hopefully, you can hear it. But if you can't hear it, uh, I'll explain what's going on. It's pretty clear. It's from Candid Camera, by the way, which tells you all you need to know. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with a white shirt, the lady with a trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality, but little by little, he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera so, staff. So what we have here, we have a beautiful slow motion candid camera replay because the computer is a little old. But so this guy, look at him. Look at him. He's, all that's happened is he's walked into a lift. He stands there facing the back. And then everyone else comes into the lift and they all just stand looking at him. And he's, he, he, he doesn't know what to do. He starts fiddling. There they are, they're all facing the wall. He's kind of looking and looking and looking and yeah, and in the end, he ends up facing the wall. Let me show you another, because this is a little slow. He's looking at his watch, just trying to make that excuse. Okay. So let's see if we can see another one. We get the, let the computer catch up. So now we have, so here, this guy, 
Here he is. He's got a, he's got his hat on. There's there's Charlie. He works for Candid Camera. Charlie closes the door. Now, what this elevator experiment is is exploring is the idea of social pressure. So you can put people in this in this situation where they know how they're supposed to behave, and look, suddenly everyone has turned to the left. This guy, he's, he doesn't know what's happening. Um, you can make people face to the back. You can make people face to the front. You can make them do whatever you like simply by you know, exerting this kind of social pressure on them. And there is a, a kind of... There's, there's, there's one, of these, one of these shots where you see somebody just erupt into rage. He doesn't know what's going on. He walks into the elevator. He walks out of the elevator. He goes back into the elevator. He comes back out of the elevator. He's pacing backwards and forwards. All these people are doing is just standing there facing the wrong direction. This guy is more, he's more receptive of the situation. Now he's facing the back again. There's this tremendous social pressure. And in the end, they manage also to get the guy to put his hat on. They all put their hats on. They all turn around. He turns around. They all put their hats on. Uh, and then they all take their hats off, and as they take their hats off... And now, do you think we could reverse like, right. the procedure? Watch. They've all got their hats off. Boom. So it's just a, it's a beautiful little explanation of the power of social pressure. <laughs> now, this elevator experiment was uh, inspired by uh, a guy called Solomon Ash. So Solomon Ash is um, Solomon Ash is, is a psychologist who was published his most famous research in the 1950s. And this is relevant because I'm saying we need to experiment, we need to try different things out. Um, but can we try things out if we're surrounded by other people who are all doing the same thing? Turns out to be very difficult. So Solomon Ash's most famous experiment was a test of whether could you get people to say completely the wrong thing if they were surrounded by other people also saying the wrong thing. So he lined people up, he recruited some experimental subjects, and he showed them two cards, one with three lines on, A, B, C, different lengths, one with a single line on, called the reference line, and he would say, okay, which of these three lines, A, B, C, is the same length as the reference line. And then he would, he would go down uh, the row of people, and let's say the, the correct answer is B. So he goes down the row of people, A, 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 A. Now we get to the end of the line, and now you're feeling like the guy in the elevator. What's happening? You look at your watch. You rub your forehead. You giggle. You mutter. You, you feel anxious. Because you see the answers B, but all these people are saying A. Of course, the experiment is a trick. All of these people are working for Solomon Ash. They're all working for the experimenter. But only you are being experimented on. And so in these cases, not always, but very often, Solomon Ash could get the person at the end of the line to say, I think the answer is, is A, even though the real answer is B. The, what's interesting about this is how, what a small change does to people's reactions. So if you rerun the experiment, and uh, the same setup, the true answer is B, you go down the line. A, 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 B. A, 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 get to the end of the line. Now, it turns out, this is not a popularity contest. There is one other person in the room who has said the right thing, and that's enough. That gives permission to, not even that. You can do it like this. We go down the line. A, 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 C. A, 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 get to the end. Now, nobody has said the right answer, but one person has said something different, a different answer, and that's enough. And usually people, if they see one other person in the room who says something different, they will say what they believe to be the truth. So I would encourage you, by the way, to spend the rest of your life just going to meetings and saying the wrong thing. 
as long as it's a different wrong thing to what everyone else in the meeting is saying, you, you are actually adding a great deal of value to the conversation. Because there might be somebody in that meeting with a really good idea, and they don't say anything. And until they hear your stupid idea, and then they go, okay, right, any idea is allowed in this meeting, so I have an idea too. This is one of the reasons why a diversity of viewpoints is so important in any group. But this is one of the, the most powerful obstacles to just trying something interesting and new. You're in a room where everybody says, we already know the policy, or we already know the strategy. The strategy is A. And you, you think mm, maybe we should try B. It's very, very difficult to break out of that. So one solution to that is to make sure you get people in the room who disagree. Another solution is to have <clears throat> a process where the, the chair uh, or the facilitator says, we don't make a decision until we've had a proper disagreement. Until somebody can tell me why this is a bad idea, we don't really know whether it's a good idea. So I, I, we need that kind of disagreement. And President Kennedy used to do this after some big foreign policy problems, some big errors where everybody around him just said the same thing. He would start to split his advisors into groups and say, okay, you guys work on A, you guys work on B, then we get back together and then we'll, we can have a proper conversation. So you need that disagreement before you can take that first step towards good mistakes of trying something new and different. Okay, but then you've tried something new. Now what? Now comes the second obstacle. Does anybody know what this is a photograph of? Yes, it is a water pump, absolutely. It's called a play pump. Um, you work in development? No, it just happened to... So, yeah, I, put, I posted this photograph um, on the World Bank's blog. Um, first ever blog at the World Bank. I used to, to run it. That, that's, that's how I roll. And um, I saw a, a, a post about this new idea that in development, just a little idea. What we're going to do is we will take away water pumps, the, the hand pumps, from uh, African villages, and we'll replace them with the children's merry-go-round, a roundabout. And the children can play, but as they play, it pumps water. The water goes into the tank. You can see the tank there. It's advertised by Unilever. Um, great idea. The children get something to play. The whole thing is paid for by, spon by sponsorship, so there's no, there's no cost. Um, and the women of the village, because it's always the women, uh, when they come, they don't have to pump water. They could just turn on a tap. Safe water, great, great, great idea. So I posted this picture. That's all fine. I think it's fine to explore new ideas. But the question I have is, by what criteria did I decide that this project was a successful project? And I can tell you the criteria. It was, this is a nice picture. And if we're honest, that's how we make a lot of decisions about what works and what doesn't. It's a nice picture. It's a nice story. But we don't really know whether it actually works. And it turns out this particular iteration of the play pump had a lot of problems. Because while the pump works technically, in many contexts, it doesn't actually work for the villagers practically for a really simple reason. And the really simple reason is not enough children. If you go to a really busy township in South Africa, loads of children, this can work. If you go to a village in Malawi, you don't have the population density to fill the tank. So the tank is always empty. So what you've done is you've taken a perfectly good hand pump and you've replaced it with an expensive piece of kit that works less well because the, the women of the village, because it's always the women, they have to pump like this. And once more, they have to pump like, like this, and then they, they have to pump the water up into the tank. They don't just pump the water into a bucket or a container, they pump the water up into the tank. So then you've made the whole thing much less efficient. But here's the problem. There is no easy way for the villagers in Malawi to say this is not working. They can't just 
you know, ping you on Twitter. They don't have the communications. They don't have the contacts. So I, find, I found out that this was a problem because a Canadian engineer called Owen Scott went to Malawi in 2005, 2006. And of course, he could see what anybody in Malawi could see, which is this is not working. But the difference is he has a video camera. He has an internet connection. He has a social network. And so very quickly, he explains that this is a problem. He does video interviews with local teachers. He, orders, uh, he organizes pump-offs. So in places where you still have the old pump, he shows how slow the new pump is and how quick the old pump is. And he persuades the development organizations that are sending these pumps to think again about how they're designed and where they're sent. And what, importantly, what the feedback mechanism is. Because that's fundamentally what this is about. It's great to have a new idea. It's great to try a new idea. But you have to have a mechanism to find out if it fails. In the market, it's no problem. The mechanism is the bank. They stop lending you money. The bankruptcy courts, they close down your shop. Yet the market will tell you that you have failed. That's not a problem. But in many other policy areas, the market will not tell anybody that they've failed. We need another mechanism. And very often that mechanism is simply to say, we just need to get the data. Or sometimes we just need to leave them a phone and a phone number so they can tell us how it's working. So the first obstacle to good mistakes I described was that groupthink. Everybody is thinking in the same way. You don't try something new. And the second obstacle I described, this one, is you try something new and then you never find out whether it was a good idea or not because you never get the feedback you want. And of course, this is a big problem in any large organization. People don't speak honestly about problems. But if we're, if we're honest with ourselves, I think it's a problem for all of us. It's very hard for your friends to say, you know what, you should really consider using some deodorant. Um, or you know, you know when, you, when you interrupt people in that way, it's incredibly annoying. Stop doing that. It's, we don't expect to hear this from our friends. If we do hear it, we don't, like, we don't like it. And they know we don't like it, so they don't say it. And so society is maintained by all these nice little lies. And that's good. That's good. I don't want people to be horrible to each other. But it does make it very difficult to improve. And I think the model for feedback is not positive feedback or negative feedback. The model for feedback is specific feedback. And think about the sports coach. If I go to learn to play tennis or, or to swim, and I have a coach. I don't expect the coach to, to be positive or negative. I just expect the coach to be specific. Tell me what I need to do, and then tell me what I need to do to get better. And that's the model we should have more in policy, in business, in personal life, but too often we don't. So what's the third obstacle? Well, the, for the third obstacle, um, this is also about feedback. It's about the... the the way feedback happens. So let, let me tell you a little story about um, the, the Kramer Prize. The Kramer Prize was a prize given by uh, an, a British industrialist. This was back when we had uh, industrialists in Britain, back in the 1960s. And, and Kramer said, I, I'm going to announce a prize. Uh, and in today's terms, it's about uh, 1 million euros. I will announce a prize for the first person who can produce an aeroplane that can fly in a figure of eight, about uh, three quarters of a kilometer, two meters above the ground, uh, only on human power. If you can build a human powered airplane to do that, a million euros. And you might say, well, this is a silly idea, right? Who needs a human-powered aeroplane? It's like some, uh, some old comedy movie, right? These people flapping their wings. But actually, it's important because if you can build a human-powered aeroplane, you can build a, a low-powered aeroplane. And if you can build a low-powered aeroplane, you can build a solar-powered aeroplane. This is, so this is an interesting technology, and it's becoming very relevant now with, with the rise of drones. So Kramer announces the prize, and people try to win it. So the best aeronautical engineers in the world try to win it. And what they do is they build a plane. They think really hard. They build the best plane they can. 
they put a pilot in, they take off, they crash, of course, because there's always something you didn't think of when you were uh, at the drawing board, when you were planning everything. And so they learn from their crash, they learn from their mistake, they make some little changes to their design, they go back, they build another aeroplane, six months later, they put the pilot in the aeroplane, they take off, they crash. It takes a long time. It's very expensive. You crash a lot of aeroplanes. Then, nearly 20 years after people have been try first been trying to win this prize, an American aeronautical engineer called Paul McCready arrives. And he says, you guys are solving the wrong problem. You think your problem is to build a human-powered aircraft. No. Your problem is to build an aircraft which, after you crash it, you can fix it and fly it again quickly. Right now, it takes you six months. You have to build a new plane. And so Paul McCready designed an aeroplane that was made out of modular kits. They, it snaps together, just very simple, um, light, like cling film surfaces for the wings. Uh, and what happens is you put the pilot in, you take off, you crash, of course. The pilot gets out, has lunch. The air crew fix the plane. They learn from their problems, the mistakes. They change it a little. Pilot gets back in, takes off, crashes. The pilot goes and has an afternoon coffee. Meanwhile, the team are fixing the plane. Maybe there's time for one more flight before supper and another flight the next day before breakfast. You can crash this thing two or three times a day, no problem. It's not expensive. And each time you learn. That was the real problem. Once you have that, the human-powered aeroplane, it's going to come. And it did come. Nine months later, Paul McCready won the Kramer Prize. And then uh, he built a better aeroplane. The first one was called the Gossamer Condor. The second one, the Gossamer Albatross. It's so thin, you can't even see the wings. And um, the Gossamer Albatross won the second Kramer Prize. The second Kramer Prize was for flying across uh, from England to France, which, as you know, is a little bit more than three quarters of a kilometer. But just a few months later, he had the second prize too. All because he realized the real problem is how do we learn very quickly and cheaply from our failures? Now, this is something that Silicon Valley says it, it's understood. Yeah, we fail, but we're going to fail really quickly and really cheaply. Of course, it's easier if you're talking about a plug-in for Gmail to fail quickly and, and cheaply than if, say, if you're the Ford Motor Company. Oh, well, the brakes don't work. It's OK. We fix it in the next release. So partly this is, partly this is a psychological attitude. Partly this is to do with the fundamentals of the technology. Um, but we can all learn from Paul McCready. Whenever we have a new project to think, this might not work, we may need to learn lessons. How do we make sure we learn the lesson as quickly as we possibly can and as cheaply as we possibly can? And if you want me to name one industry that does this the worst of all, perhaps even worse than government, which is very good at making mistakes very, very slowly and very expensively, I would say it's the financial sector. When you think about what happened in the financial sector before the crisis, they weren't making more mistakes than any other industry. But because of the nature of finance, you could take a small mistake and you could turn it into a big mistake before anybody knew of the consequences. So you securitize mortgages from the, a, an idea that's nothing to an idea that affects the entire American banking system. You can do that three or four years. Credit default swaps, you can go from almost nothing in the 1990s to a derivatives market of hundreds of billions of dollars by 2007 without ever really subjecting it to that test. Of course, eventually the test comes. And like all, you know, all bad ideas in market systems, you fail. But because the experiment got so big, that's the problem. So whether we're talking about building a plane, building a new business, or testing a new financial product, or a government policy. The aim is not to eliminate failure. The aim is to discover failure as early as possible.
You can discover the failure quickly and learn from the failure quickly, and the failure doesn't do you much harm. So those are the, the three obstacles, the first three obstacles. Number one, groupthink. We all think the same way, so we don't try something new. Number two, feedback that we don't ask for, we don't collect. So we make a mistake and then we don't find out. Or related, number three, feedback loops that are too slow, they're too expensive. We make a mistake, we learn from the mistake, but it takes so much time or so much money. 